it's Jenny. And this is Alexa. And we're back with another episode of Checked Out, the Lexington Public Library's podcast. And we have a very special guest with us today. Uh, today in the audio booth is Jamie Ford, the New York Times bestselling author of Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet and Songs of Willow Frost. His new one is called Love and Other Consolation Prizes. Welcome, Jamie. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm doing jazz hands. <laughs> Well, we're so excited to have you here. I think a lot of people probably know you from Hotel of Corner, the Corner of Bitter and Sweet. Indeed. Um, if you if you're not familiar with the book, uh, do you want to give uh, listeners a little rundown of that story? Sure. Yeah, it's uh, post apocalyptic. A lot of zombies. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's surprising. Um, no, it's a uh, uh, Hotel in the Corner of Bitter and Sweet is it's really the story of the Japanese internment, but it's seen through the eyes of a 12 year old Chinese boy, and it's also a love story and kind of a kind of a coming of age story. It's a very sweet love story. Mm-hmm. And your new one, Love and Other Consolation Prizes, I just finished. I have book hangover from. Um, I, I Pulling my head out of it was so surreal because you really do feel immersed in in Seattle at the turn of the, the 20th century. Mm-hmm. Um, and this book is, is fantastic. It, it follows a young boy named um, Ernest Young who starts as a small child in China. He is effectively given away by his mother um, for hope of a better life, comes to America. A whole host of things befall him. It sort of reminds me of like Oliver Twist slash mm-hmm. Jane Eyre. Did yeah. you get that too, Alexa? Very much yeah. so, yeah. With, with hookers. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then he, that's, and, but then he ends up in a brothel, yeah. uh, you know. working at a brothel, um, and has two very close friends, um, Fawn and Maisie. Um, and it's about, the story alternates between um, his life in, in 1909 Seattle and his life in 1962 Seattle. Did I get those dates right? Nailed it. Awesome. <laughs> totally nailed it. I couldn't remember the first the first year exactly. Nineteen. It's like nineteen oh nine, nineteen ten. And and in the in the in the nineteen sixty two part, he is t- caring for his his wife who's struggling with dementia. Um, and you're desperately trying to figure out who he married. Which one of his friends did he marry? One of them. <laughs> the wife has a different name. <laughs> <laughs> it stressed me out. I couldn't wait to get to the end. Um, I will not spoil it for our, for our listeners, though. You have to read this book. It is absolutely beautiful. Um, so now that I've rambled on about how much I love this story, um, I want to ask you, um, one of the things that you really do so well is really painting a picture of time and place, mm-hmm. especially the early, you know, the scenes in, in Seattle, 1909. What kind of research did you have to do to allow you to do that? Oh, wow. Um, I was always fascinated with the uh, Seattle's Forgotten World's Fair. I mean, most people are familiar with the 62 World's Fair, with the Space Needle, and Elvis visited the fair. But uh, Seattle's Forgotten World's Fair was in 1909. And, and you know, there's, there's a pretty good pictorial record at the University of Washington, lots of uh, newspaper articles and things like that. Um, and lots of people you can just, you know, it's, it's a whole section of a museum in Seattle. So I get to go to those museums and put on the white gloves and go through their archives and stuff like that. It's fun. What yeah. was it that drew you to the World's Fair as a backdrop? Well, you know, the, 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 the University of Washington occupies a big chunk of Seattle, but before it was uh, UW, it was the grounds of the World's Fair, and a, a bits of that still remain, and if you walk around, you can kind of see the skeletal remnants of what was once there. It's this big, grand happening. Um, super fascinated about that. Um, mainly because the exhibits were sort of askew of normal. So they would have ethnographic exhibits, which is basically a human zoo where they take indigenous people and put them on display and then charge people money to look at them. And that was always odd. And uh, they had a a newborn baby exhibit where they had all these babies in incubators and they had nurses, but the nurses were actually carnies in nurse garb. Um, So there was just enough of a weirdness that I was fascinated. And I kept on stumbling upon this mention of this boy named Ernest who was raffled off. And the fact that they raffled off a child was rather jarring and was a, a research rabbit hole that I just wanted to go down. I couldn't find out what happened to him aside from where he came from, what he was, who donated him, uh, ads that mentioned the day they were going to raffle him off and things like that. Because um, all the records were destroyed in the 30s from uh, the receiving home where he came from. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is so, another thing you talk you you touch on in this book is sort of abandoned and children or children who are uh, come to the United States uh, somehow looking for a better life but really get forced into what is basically white slavery. I mean, it's, yeah. it's awful. Yeah, it's really it's, it's really weird to think that you know decades after the Emancipation Proclamation, people were still brought to this country 
in not above board circumstances and are often basically served in, you know, sold into uh, indentured servitude, basically trafficked to this country. Um, and sometimes that servitude was benign and you were a servant. Sometimes it was more malignant and, you know, you were basically a slave or in the sex trade or something like that. Um, another thing is kind of a common thread uh, through your books. Your protagonists are largely Asian Americans mm-hmm. in a lot of your stories. And how important is diversity and representation to you in the books that you write? It's funny. When I, when I first wrote Hotel, I didn't think anybody would read it because I'm, I'm half Chinese and I'm writing about something that's very personal. And I didn't see a lot of books on the shelves with Asian American characters. And then, you know, that book became a bestseller like in Norway, where there's not a lot of Chinese people, <laughs> you know? And so there's, I, I think that there's a learning curve that I think people enjoy sort of going along for that ride. And so that 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 diversity theme is woven through all my books. And this one especially, where I have characters who are Japanese and Chinese. And in the 62 time period, there's a character who's Filipino. And just to sort of represent that neighborhood and sometimes to look at how people were treated then and how they're treated now. And some things have progressed nicely and some things were still kind of frozen in you know, cultural time war. I know you talk about it in Hotel and Bitter and Sweet, there's a character who wears a button that says, I am Chinese. Mm-hmm. Because he is after, during and after World War II, there was a lot of um, anti-Japanese uh, sentiment. And I think you mentioned in an article that your grandfather did the same thing as a child. My father. Your father. Yeah, my dad was 13 at, during World War II and wore an I am Chinese button um, because he would walk to school and kids would throw rocks at him, mm-hmm. calling him a Jap. Um, and and s- still things happen. I, I mean, I'm, I'm even now, think, as I'm driving in today, I'm thinking about the next book I'm working on. And, and it's still about identity. Just, I mean, not, not to run up the flagpole and, and make too big of a deal of it, but there are certain things that still persist. And it's interesting to look at my daughter, who's, when she was a freshman in college, she, uh, you know, uh, was joining a sorority. And, some, and she's part Asian. And, and one of the uh, sorority sisters told her, like, I hate to break it to you, but, but uh, you look kind of Asian. And she had to say, well, I hate to break it to you, but I am Asian. Oh, my gosh. Um, and so there's still weird biases that persist. And I, I, and I, I don't write about those things to malign people or to shame people, but I find it fascinating. Yeah. I think as a culture, we don't move as quickly as we would like to. I, and as a historical researcher, I see it all the time where I see a trend from 70, 80 years ago, and then we're still kind of fighting that same battle. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I feel like there's been such a huge push, especially in YA books recently, for, for more yeah. diversity. Well, yeah, that, that really came to a head a couple of years ago, mm-hmm. maybe five years ago at Book Expo America, where they, you know, the largest gathering in New York City or in the world, but they have it in New York City. And they had a they had a, a poster with all of their young adult authors. Mm-hmm. And I think there were you know, 30 of them and they were all Caucasian people yeah. and Angry Cat. Because Angry Cat had a book out that year. Um, and so it was just really jarring and uh, to, to sort of sort of look at that and go, oh, maybe we're we're not as inclusive as we want to be. And then I think there's been kind of a, the floodgates have opened yeah. and agents and publishing houses are now looking for stories that uh, that represent other people. Um, Sherman Alexie has a great book. Uh, I think it's called Thunder Boy. That's not my book, I promise. Um, Thunder Boy Jr., and it's uh, it's you know it's a children's book with uh, Native American characters, mm-hmm. and um, I volunteer at the Boys and Girls Club in Montana, and probably a third of the kids are are you know they're Crow or they're Blackfeet, they're they're Native kids, and there's no books with Native American faces, and so that book you know is was readily consumed in that environment. So it's it's feeding a need. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely, it is. I know the library I came from before before Northside. Um, had, the Village Library, which has a lot of uh, bilingual families that go to that library, a lot of bilingual staff, and it was the same thing for for kids there, trying to get you know books with um, Latino protagonists in their hands. Yeah, and, you know, it, it's just nice to see yourself. I think yeah, in the books that totally you read. is in a positive way. Absolutely, exactly. Like, exactly. absolutely, That's absolutely. Key. So I know that you do have a large family. Did that influence the way that you were able to write Ernest as a child at all? Were you able to draw from some of your children's experiences? You know, it's weird. I tend to, um, I don't ever want to channel my children because it feels kind of like I'm strip mining my family's 
just, you know, I don't mind writing about my grandmother because she's passed away or mm-hmm. my grandfather. Um, but I think it would uh, totally tweak out my kids if they saw themselves too closely represented. Sure. Um, it's not to say that I don't kind of wink at it or nod at it. Like that story I mentioned with my daughter in college that definitely is going to manifest itself in this new book. Mm-hmm. Um because it was just very interesting, and it's been lingering in my mind ever since. Not not even in really a bad way, but just, um, I'm just curious about it. Sort of the, the, what created that scenario. Um, a lot of what I do is inspired from um, family of a, a couple generations back, or um, aunties and uncles and things mm-hmm. like that. I was mostly impressed that way. Seven, I've got seven children, right? You have seven children? Six. Six. Yeah, we have a total Brady Bunch family. So, I was mostly <laughs> impressed that you actually have time to write yeah. with six kids. That's pretty amazing. That's it's, fantastic. Yeah. I think I'm going to be more productive now because I'm, I'm an empty nester. So my, my youngest went off to college. I'm actually speaking at his college in a month, so that'll be kind of well, that's a, exciting. a trip. Yeah. yeah. I can totally embarrass him from the... Uh, from the podium. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. It's like the dream. It Every is. Dream. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And there's my son, Lucas. So, yeah. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> well, the great thing about this book, I think, is that you, for any, for anybody listening who is not sure, you might, sometimes I, I look at, you know, bestsellers and I think, I don't know if that's really my thing. I don't know if that's really my genre, but you really hit so many things for those. My first thought when I read the, the back was that, you know, it's about this, um, older gentleman taking care of his wife with dementia and flashing back to his youth. And I went, oh my gosh, it's like the notebook. So mm-hmm. if you like romance, there's a little bit of that there, but it's also a great historical fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also just a great kind of sweeping epic mm-hmm. uh, in the vein of maybe an Oliver Twist or a Jane Eyre. So it's Roman. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a book about, it's, you know, it's, it touches on race a little bit, on class a little bit, definitely on the roles of women a hundred years ago and how they hadn't really changed that much by the time you got to the sixties. There's a suffragette uh, element to it because uh, yeah, the Washington is is looking at getting, getting women to vote. Yeah. They actually have the the right to to vote, you know, 20 plus years ahead of the rest of the country. And then women did the unthinkable. They voted and that totally ticked off men in governance who took the vote back and they didn't get it back for quite a long time. But then when they did get it back, it was still, you know, 10 years ahead of the rest of the country. Um, it was just weird, and, and I and I understand why. Like the mayor, uh, man named Mayor Gill, and the police chief um, together. The, the, this is the mayor and the police chief built a 500 room brothel, um, which resulted in uh, the mayor being recalled <laughs> um, for obvious reasons. Sure. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was it was kind of a a coming of age tale for the whole city. It's kind of a frontier town jumping into a modern era. It's absolutely beautiful, and it definitely puts you in that environment. Mm-hmm. Um, so for folks in Lexington, this won't air until after the event, unfortunately, but for folks in Lexington lucky enough to catch Jamie tonight at Beaumont, uh, he will be speaking at the Beaumont branch tonight at 7 o'clock. Uh, but you're coming back to Kentucky in November, right, for the book fair? I am coming back to the book fair. Yeah, Yay! looking forward to it. So if you miss Jamie this time, you can catch him at the Kentucky Book Fair in November at the Kentucky Horse Park All Tech Only Arena. Um, anything you want to add? I think we've covered it. Anything you want to talk about before we do our wrap-ups uh, that we didn't cover? Yeah, I'll just throw this out because it was—it just happened recently. Mm-hmm. Um, the, much of the book takes place in Seattle's Red Light District, and there was a woman, um, a character in the book named Florence Nettleton, Madam Flora, mm-hmm. who ran this this high-class brothel, and, and and she's a forgotten figure. I, I really just knew her name and a, a, a whiff of a police. She's record. a real person. She is. Madam Flora's a real person. She's a real person. Oh wow! And I did an event. Uh, last Saturday, and an older gentleman came to my event and said, I knew Madame Flora. What? It just blew me away. That's amazing. Yeah. And so he, he gave, he, we talked about it for a while, and he, he gave me a whole bunch of notes that he had written down. Um, his father owned a furniture, tro- a furniture store in Seattle that provided uh, the beds to oh this gosh. place. And so he and his little brother would tag along when his father was making deliveries. Um, and the uh, the ladies of the place would bake cookies for them, and his mother wow. would never never let him eat the cookies of from the brothel. Of course, right? Yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I love sort of writing historical fiction, and occasionally, mm-hmm. you know, it sort of manifests in real life, and someone yeah. will pop out and say, "Hey, this is this is my experience with this." That somebody was... supplying beds to a brothel, like somebody has to. That's somebody so, had to. That's so great. <laughs> <was> so crazy. <laughs> yeah, and and he said that she was a very um, 
you know, super intelligent, mm-hmm. erudite woman, yeah. um, very flamboyant, very colorful, um, educated her girls, mm-hmm. and was very plugged into, you know, the city council and things like that. It was amazing. All right, that's all we've got today. I want to thank Jamie Ford, our special guest. Once again, his new book is Love and Other Consolation Prizes. The library has lots of copies, and I definitely recommend you run out and get one. It is fantastic. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. All right, that's all we've got today. I want to thank Jamie Ford, our special guest. Once again, his new book is Love and Other Consolation Prizes. The library has lots of copies, and I definitely recommend you run out and get one. It is fantastic. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much.